Good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Tabman, and welcome to Crimes and Times. One of the favorite topics people always like to hear about is the serial killer. And we're going to talk about that tonight with a best-selling author, Fred Rosen. Fred, how are you doing? I'm fine, Michael. How are you doing? We're doing good. Hey, before we get into the topic of your book, which we're going to discuss today, tell us a little bit about the books you've written and specifically some of the other true crimes that you've covered over your career. Well, I, I've been an investigative reporter for the last ooh, 20 or 20 some odd years. Um, and it, the probably my um, baptism under fire was the Lobster Boy case uh, down here in Florida, where I personally got involved in the case and I came up with the evidence that led to the conviction. Wow of both killers and it happens that that book's on sale today for buck 99. Go ahead, what's the name of it? Give us the name of the book. Go ahead, we'll let you pump it now. Okay, it's called Lobster Boy. It's uh the ebook is on sale today for $1.99. Just go to just go to Amazon and type in Lobster Boy and that's it. There you go. So Fred, what do you track anyway, you? I'm sorry, as a journalist, what did you cover as a journalist mostly? Were you a crime journalist or something else? No. No, what happened was I originally, uh, my, my background is, is actually in film. I, was, I, start, I, I have a, a Master of Fine Arts in Film from USC's film school. And so I was going to get into the movie business, but then things happened. And I wound up becoming a freelance writer. You know, you need a job and blah, blah, blah. And then for years, I, I wrote celebrity profiles. I did stuff about cruises. You know, I was a travel writer. And then eventually I became a, uh, uh, a journalism professor at Hofstra University. And off of that, I was approached to write a true crime book. And I took to it like a duck to water. And, and, and um, it, it's, it's, you know, and I eventually realized after working on oh 20 some odd cases i'm i suppose i speak for the dead that's part of my job and that's i get it i i that's how i feel when i work on a case interesting now just for the audience you talked about hofstra you're you're a new york boy yes right? as am i and so for the audience you know you and i don't know each other personally we've only met you know through facebook but when i get around other new yorkers uh, my already fast speech starts to speed up anyway. So uh, <laughs> if that starts happening during the show, I'm blaming it on you, okay? Okay, you blame uh, it on me. I try to keep it under control, but when I get another guy like you, bada bee, bada bing, and we start going, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no, knowing where, no knowing where it may end up. Anyway, Fred, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we do have this fascination with serial killers. And whenever we've talked about serial ki killers and these uh, or unsolved murders, they're some of the most popular of our own episodes here on crimes and times. As a journalist, as an author, what do you see as this incredible fascination we have with serial killers? Uh, what I see is there's an a, a there but for the grace of God aspect. That is, there is a vicarious thrill that people get uh, in realizing they're not the victims and at the same time people really wonder what makes these individuals tick why would they do what they do and I believe that's what accounts for well that's certainly what accounts for a lot of people's interest in it but if you really want to talk about what uh, made it into a home run so to speak it would have to be there's no question it would have to be uh silence of the lambs hannibal lecter you know with that fictional character um serial killers became i don't know you know as as, as popular as anything else right and that also launched the uh, fbi's behavioral analysis unit into stardom and a lot of the guys who worked in there uh you know got uh, contracts to work with Hollywood and these shows, consulting oh, yeah. shows, and what was sort of a little-known aspect of the FBI's function turned into a moneymaker for guys in retirement. If I had only known then where things were heading, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's very true. Uh, you know that. You know, if you were, it, it, it's everybody's looking for a deal. You know, when you leave whatever job you've got, 
especially when you're when you're trained in that area. The thing that really gets me personally um, angry, really angry. There's a TV series called uh, Criminal Minds, yes, which purports to show the behavioral science section of the FBI tracking down serial killers. It is f so full of crap. <laughs> I can't stand it. I can't watch it. Well, I, would I, like I have to be careful here because uh, one of my colleagues is a consultant on that show. That's I've okay. Had him, I've had him on Crimes and Times, so I don't want to... Uh, Criticize any well, you don't have to crit I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> criticize. I'll simply say it's not accurate. Doesn't work that way, folks. Well, come it's, it's on. Also, I always said if I had my own personal Garcia, I would have solved every crime I, I've ever come across in that case, uh, the cross referencing. Uh, you know, also, and again, I've, I've worked with profilers in my career for various reasons. I've had them on Crimes and Times to go, get us insight, and I, and I do admire the knowledge and their expertise. But I think if we look back at profiling as a crime-fighting tool, we have to recognize that while the profile may come out to be very accurate after we've made an arrest, I can't think of a time when the profile actually directly led to the arrest of a suspect. You're a true crime author. Are you familiar with any time that no. happened? No. Right. And Not at all. Come, right, but they are fairly accurate. But, you know, again, where does that get us other than saying, hey, it was pretty accurate? Exactly. Again, because there's such a wide pool and there's so many people that fit that. And I could think of some cases now. I think out in New York, uh, a few years ago, I remember I was on a radio show talking about that. And there was the serial killer that was discovered in Long Island. The, the, where they were looking for a runaway girl. Oh, they, they're still looking for him. And they're still looking for him. And they had such specific information uh, down to what they thought was his occupation. Uh, because not really because of a profile, more because of physical evidence involved. And yet... It's still unsolved. Exactly. Right. So, but as we always say, uh, media is for entertainment, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I know, you know, I have two novels, uh, Midnight Sin and Bad Intent. I would like to get them as TV shows. Uh, but people have asked me about your writing. They asked me, what would you critique as you know, your worst or your weakness in writing? And I think the, my answer is always, I try to be too real. I feel because of my experience as a police officer, as an FBI agent, I try to stay too much within the confines of reality. And whenever something happens or I, I, so there's a discovery, I'm thinking, all right, how would that really happen in true life? Or how would I acknowledge it? And I try to build this whole chapter around explaining that when well, nobody really cares, <laughs> right? How yeah. it would have happened or how realistic it is. They want entertainment. Yeah. Right. So do you prefer your fictional work or your true crime work? Well, I don't write fiction. Oh, you don't. Uh, okay. I've written a couple of novels, but they haven't been published. No, I prefer writing um, nonfiction, but I what I write is narrative nonfiction. I, when I started out, I took a page out of Tom Wolfe's book, uh, who unfortunately just passed away, and he revolutionized what's known as the new journalism, which is an ability of writers to use um, – the technique, it's, an, it's it, we use the techniques of fiction to tell our story. Nothing's fictionalized, but for instance, in, 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 a, in a good uh, narrative nonfiction book, you're going to find a lot of dialogue, just like you would in fiction. But it's based upon, it, like in this book, in, in Bi The Bayou Strangler, it's, it's what happened. It's based upon, not based upon, but it's verbatim from the statement that he gives the police. You know, when they finally get him. Perfect segue. Let's get into it. The Bayou Strangler. All right. Tell us about that book. Uh, tell us uh, how you landed uh, on this story. And then let's get right into uh, the subject of the case. Sure. Mr. Dominique and what we know about that uh, hideous crime spree. Well, the reason I got into it was I c the, the his his serial killing spread across two millenniums started in the late uh, 90s. And they didn't get him until 2006. And what got me was that he had a kill total of 23 young men. And it received little or no national publicity. And I couldn't understand it until I realized and I got into it that the reason for that was 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 that number one it took place in the south and things in the south don't get the same publicity they would get let's say in the north or the west and number two 
the victims were all were mostly gay and Dominic is gay. And so that stuff didn't sell in the media. At least that's what I think. And therefore, they didn't cover it. And it's also very grisly. Right. But grisly tends to sell. It might be some of what you said, some of these other uh, well, di- dynamics. That sure. From making it- that's why I did the book. <laughs> I figured it would sell. And it is. All right. There you go. Good motivation. So tell us about uh, the subject, Dominique. His first name being? Ronald. Ronald Dominique, uh, serial killer. Tell us about him. Uh, generally what we know about him prior to leading up to his becoming a serial killer. He grows up in um, the in Houma, Louisiana, which is um, right on the um, the Gulf of Mexico. And um, he grows up in 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 this parish there. And um, he's closeted gay initially. And he gets a lot of criticism. Uh, what do you? Uh, um, people in his family continually uh, razz him, make fun of him, and eventually um, he he starts acting out in public, and he gets into an argument with a woman, which leads to. Uh, he, he throws a punch or something. I don't recall the specific, but the point is he goes to jail for a brief period of time. And while he's there, he's raped by another inmate. And that's what sets this guy off. And how did he respond to that? He sets him off. What happened immediately following the rape? Did he kill someone in prison? Or what no. did he do? So what happened? No. No, what happens is he 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 will start trolling for victims. See, he he wanted men where he would what he would do is he would he would find a a hustler of some sort. We're talking about now after he's in prison. Yes. Yes. After he's in prison. prison. Did he he become a bad prisoner after that rape? Did he? No. No, he was, you know, no, he was fine as far as pr- the prisons were concerned. They didn't give him a second look. So how did and he, he had he, he had base he had regular jobs. He was a pizza delivery man. All right, so he gets raped in prison, and we're suggesting that this might have been the trigger towards that. But he doesn't. Well, it, it, he 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 will tell the the, the uh, detectives on the case mm-hmm. later on. He essentially says that to them. He was always afraid when he was with, um, see, he would claim that he was afraid that the person he was with would try to have anal sex with him, which he didn't, which he, he, he didn't want because of what happened in prison. Okay. And it turned him off to that. And okay, so, so, so it wasn't like an immediate response. It was just a traumatizing response in his own words that when exposed to that reminder of that trauma is what set him off. Is, is that a correct way? Of- I would say that's absolutely 110 percent correct. And I, I just want to make a point there and whether we believe that or not believe that whatever his motivation may be. But the fact of the matter is, you know, people say, oh, it's a homosexual. Homosexuals can be raped just like prostitutes can be raped. Sure. Uh, the fact that someone engages in what you might consider, you know, deviant sexual behavior doesn't mean that they're still willing to give up the freedom of choice and to be you know, forced into something is still a trauma. And I, I, we need to know that. And I remember that specifically because I took a sex crimes investigation course back in John Jay in, in the late eight, uh, late 70s. Mm-hmm. And this is about the time when we were understanding uh, the trauma of rape and uh, understanding how bad the criminal justice system was to rape victims. And I was fortunate enough that my instructor, uh, I think it was the founding sergeant of the sex crimes unit, NYPD, and he would, would hammer that point that, you know, people say, oh, how could a prostitute be uh, raped? She engages in uh, sex with strangers all the time. Not the point. The point was her freedom of choice was taken and it was forced upon her. And she is just as much a victim as anybody else, as is a homosexual, as in anybody whose sexual activity you may not approve of. You know, but it's a violation you, you, of the body. You're really getting into something here, you know, and 
what I discovered on this case was that men, they, unless they, they were pros, you know, the cops, they don't want to even talk about this. They're very, you know, because you're talking about gay sex and you know what I'm saying. You know, men have can sometimes be very, um, you know, they, they don't they don't want to deal with it. You know, that that it exists and it gets to what you're talking about, which is it makes no difference what a person is, or what job it is or whatever. Rape is rape. Mm -hmm. Rape is rape and no is no. And That's guess, right. Given, given the tenor of society today and, and the Me Too movement, it's probably a good time to stress that point. And, and uh, Michael, I got to add this. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I go off on tangents. So you I bring do I. that. I do I, yeah. Okay, Michael. You're, but you're going to get a kid. Yeah. Now, everybody knows the TV series Law and Order SVU, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what we're talking about. Set victims investigating sexual you know victims any right. victims that yeah but 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 what i'm getting at is in in uh, upstate new york near where i used to where i used to live diane neal who played casey the prosecutor casey novak on law and order is running for congress there we go <laughs> there we go and, and i'm laughing michael and i'm going now, you'll get a kick out of this. You've run for office. And I'm saying, does that mean he, she's going to bring in Mariska Hargitay to be her campaign manager? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Richard uh, Belzer? <laughs> name, name recognition works. And, and for the audience who's wondering, uh, Fred is referring to the fact that I was recently running for governor for the state of Kansas. But I stopped my campaign recently just based on the fact that I came in very late and I just didn't have the political machinery necessary to continue it. Uh, men start to have uh, anal sex with him. He started to panic or uh, yes. felt traumatized. And then he engaged in murder, just from that? Yes. What he would do is he was very intuitively smart. And he, he was able to use his size and his weight. And he was really a strong guy and he's not big. And he could pin him down. And then what he would do is he'd bludgeon him, strangle him, suffocate them. Uh, but the one thing that was common with all the victims was penetration. He would penetrate them. Yes. In the way that he did not want to be penetrated. Yes. What, I, I know you're not a psychological profile, but what do you read into that? Control. And well, it's all, because for him, it's all about control. Right. But he considered that almost torturous to have that done to him. Yes. So is this some sort of, uh, you know, sadism on his part by trying to torture his, uh, yes. his victim? Yes. Yes. So I wouldn't I don't know if I'd say use the word torture, but certainly. Well, he found he found it traumatic. Which, yes. You know, uh, you know what? I think you're right. That's an excellent, excellent perspective. I agree with you. So one would ask uh, when he makes this excuse or reason, whatever, for murdering, that's because I was traumatized by being reminded of this one would say, well, why can't he just say no? And say, I don't hmm. want to do that. Yeah. So, so now in our conversation, do we believe that, or do we think that's just his rationalization, or just some BS explanation uh, coming from a serial killer? Uh, you mean as far as, as killing the, the right? As, as his motivation is because I'm so uh, when someone try to have oh. sex with me, I'm so. Uh, it's B it's BS. Okay. It's BS because it's 23 times. You know, if you don't if you don't like it, don't do it. Right. So now we're talking about, let's say he, when he got raped in prison to the time he committed his first murder, uh, about how much time passed? Well, about oh, years? I, um, I'd have to look it up. I don't it wasn't very long. It could be a year. OK. And and again, I don't mean to try to pin you on timeline here from the time he got out of prison, though, he didn't start it right away. As you said, he held almost a normal life. He was a pizza delivery guy. He did some other things before he actually started engaging in serial killers, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he, But even when he was engaging in serial killing, he had jobs. Right, as did Ted Bundy and some other other. Yes, well yes. So why then, what do you think, based on your research, and then maybe tell us how you did this research, do you think was a driving force that made him 
uh, I don't want to say, you know, go over the edge. We don't want to say snap because people say, oh, you don't snap. It's a building process. I get that. But, you know, snapping being going from not doing it to doing it. What do you think was a real driving force? What happened in his life that led him to that? Though he clearly must have had some predisposition. Yeah, I was going to say that. I mean, I, you know, w the jury's out about, w you know, what uh, genetic links there might be. But one thing that I'm, you know, that he's been very, very clear about is the abuse he suffered growing up. And but the so, so the, the, sure, that's a motivating force. But we live in a country where, unfortunately, many individuals have, have been discriminated against and ridiculed because of their sexual preference, but they don't go out and kill people. So if you're talking about, you know, what's that one element that um, turned this guy, I would say that... Um, there's no question that the rape did, but also he didn't have any internal. Um, he didn't. I don't. I don't think this guy really had any any role models or anything of that nature that could have helped him in terms of determining not so much right and wrong, but having a conscience, and that's what it really comes down to. Serial killers don't have a conscience. Right. And, and when we look back at some of the profiles of these serial killers, some of the things we see are, again, torturing or killing animals as kids, uh, maybe uh, Very kind of violence out of, out of character with what's happening as a kid. Do we have any indication of those red flags in his childhood? Not here. No, nobody. We don't have the background going back that far. Oh, we just don't have it. So we don't know. We just don't have it. No. Okay. Right. No, what basically, and, and the, the, it has a lot to do with the fact that they closed this case so incredibly quickly that they didn't even, you know, do that. They didn't even go back and right. say, okay. Let, let's get into the nitty gritty. You're making a great point here. So let's tell the audience, let's start talking about his MO, what happened, how many people killed, and then the entree of the law enforcement into realizing they have a serial killer. So I know that's a big right. part of what you try to point out in your book. Yes. The, the what happens here is um, Dominique starts killing in which is uh, uh, New Orleans. It's the New Orleans area. And what happens at the very beginning is he kills a young man. And he's got a thing, Dominic. He wants credit. He leaves the body by the side of the road. He doesn't try to conceal the body. And let's, hold, let's talk about that. How does he even get to these bodies? What is he doing? Is he cruising? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Yes. He's, what he does is uh, he cruises. Gay he bars. He tr Gay trolls. Bars, right? hmm? Gay bars. Gay bars. Um, but, but just the streets. You know, he'd drive around on the streets and... He would approach a guy and uh, even if he approached someone who was straight, he would try to get them into his van or car by showing them a picture of a girl and claiming he could set the guy up with the girl. And some guys bought into that crap, unfortunately. So basically what he was doing was he would he would either go to gay bars, he troll the streets. He'd, he'd, he'd make a deal, sex for money, and then once he had the individual at his trailer, then he would do his thing. Now, you mentioned that he phys was a physically big guy. Uh, do we see that he tried to target victims who were smaller than him, someone he could physically dominate so he could be in that position of overpowering them? Uh, that's, you know something? That's a great question, and I'm going to say yes. When you take a look, that's one of the things that all the victims have in common, which is they weren't exceptionally big guys. And some of them were in excellent, you know, excellent condition. But, it, you know, there weren't any, you know, you know, Bruce Lee wasn't there and Arnold wasn't there. So, yes, I would say absolutely that he knew who to target. Right. And also, given the nature of, of the homosexual act, 
he could put them in a position where, as you said, he could hit them over the head and incapacitate them some way. So well, that's what control. he eventually would do. He'd either he'd he'd he'd, he'd either he'd find uh, he he'd either hit him on the head or he'd uh, uh, throttle him, you know. Um, but he did it twenty three times, which have, makes him. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Which makes him the most prolific American serial killer of the millennium. Right. Again, let's point out to the audience we're talking about fairly recent history here. Uh, he's still in prison. He's alive in prison now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was convicted in 2000. I think it was 2007. Um, may have been eight. I don't recall. It's not important. The important thing, he's he the the prosecution uh, with the approval of all the families made a deal. They took death off the table because Louisiana is a death penalty state. And they did something that I think is really terrific. They decided, the prosecution and the police, and the two lead detectives especially, they wanted to give closure to all 23 families. So they made a deal with Dominique when they got him. Take us to all 23 dump sites where you left the bodies. Tell us what happened. Let us clear all 23 cases and you'll get life and not death. And, you know, and that's interesting, the whole concept of victimology and how to resolve these cases probably can make for a whole other show on Crimes and Times. Oh, yeah. It's an issue. But let's go towards now him. He commits the murders. What does he then do with the bodies? Well, that's where it's interesting, because we're talking about Louisiana Bayou country. All if you if he really wanted to, to dispose of the bodies without anybody knowing about it, all he's got to do is throw it in the bayou and the alligators will do their thing. Instead, what he would do is once he killed the individual, he would then take the body, put it in his station wagon, find some place to dump the body publicly. So it could be, let's say, for instance, it could be, uh, un, uh, it might, let's say it was, it was near an, in, um, an intersection, okay, uh, you know, where you have like a state, you know, a highway, and then you've got a little, you know, you know, you get off the highway and then whatever, okay. He would dump the body right, right where you get out of the highway, off the highway, and, because he would want somebody to find it so he'd get credit even though they don't know who he is. Okay, so right, so they find these bodies, and I imagine they could, they being the police, would recognize right away this was murder, in, at least happening during a homosexual act uh, because of uh, the penetration, semen left behind, uh, those, that type of physical evidence, right? Yeah, what happens is the first, because the first bodies are dumped in Jefferson Parish, Lieutenant Dennis Thornton gets the case, and he realize, he actually does, realizes that they've discovered two bodies, let's say, and he realizes there's a similar MO, same killer. But what Dominique does eventually is he leaves Jefferson Parish. He goes home to... Um, to Houma, Louisiana, which is south of, of, Je of New Orleans, Jefferson Parish. He goes back to a place called, it's Terrebonne Parish. And at that point, when he starts his killing again, the police officer on the case is, is Detective Don Bergeron. And eventually, there will be so many bodies down there that the state decides to form a task force. And the first person they invite to join the task force is Dennis Thornton, the first cop in the case. Right, but I would imagine for a while, we're talking now, this was the mid to late 80s when it started? Is that correct? No, he started killing in the late 90s. Late 90s, I'm sorry, right. What did I say, 80s? Okay. Yeah, Okay. but that's okay. Right, all right, 90s. And though we're into a fairly modern current era of law enforcement, we're talking with basically smaller towns, smaller city police departments. And right. back then, we probably did not have the, uh, the networks, the telecommunications, the exchange of information, where they would more quickly realize that we have two parishes within the same state experiencing 
but it's probably the same serial killer, correct? Right. They, they, they didn't make the closure initially, of course. Right. They didn't have the technology to do that. Right. And so what were they doing? Before we got into the task force, separately, how were their investigations progressing? They weren't getting them any closer to, uh, to Dominique. They, they, re- they, they weren't progressing. They, they, they were dead ends. And not only that, the, the word had come down from on high that they shouldn't give it too much priority. The implication being because some of these men that were killed were gay prostitutes and they're not taxpayers. So they're, they're, their life isn't worth the same as, some, as a taxpayer's. And, and nor would it get the hue and cry from the public as it would if they had been other, other victims. Not only that, it took a while to get the hue and cry from the gay community because they weren't putting out any information on it. So they had the physical evidence, they had an MO, and they couldn't come up with a suspect. Right? Yes. And not unusual. I didn't mean that in a critical way. Uh, that happens. Uh, we didn't have cameras like we would have now. We could backtrack a very good activity point. and find out, oh, look who he's walking with it, you know, from this gas Jeez. station. We didn't have that. Uh, I imagine we didn't have cell phones then where we could GPS and triangulate and find out what people have been. So all the stuff that we see on CSI or, or your favorite show, Criminal Minds, or, or, the, <laughs> or the things that we can do now, people saying, why didn't they do it? It's because we just didn't have the technology. I would agree with that. That's a very, you, you know, when you mentioned the, the cameras, you, you made a very, very good point. If it was today, it's very possible Dominic would have been captured on someone on street cameras you know, right. they the certainly would have reviewed the lot of a bar. Right. And we would have been able to figure out where this guy had been in a matter of moments from the phone calls and and maybe, uh, you know, what he has on his car, uh, something like that. But they did have DNA. Obviously, he left behind DNA samples. So the audience is asking, what about DNA? We just solved the Golden State Killer with DNA. Why couldn't they well, uh, make that work? Well, the, the answer is that's how they solved the case. What they did was they 20, took 23 murders later. 23 murders later, Mm -hmm. when they knew Dominique was the suspect and um, uh, they um, they were able to compare his DNA to the DNA from one of the first victims and it matched. But it was mitochondrial DNA. And hold on, I'm going to ask you about the mitochondria. I'm going to put you on yeah. the spot. You know, since you brought it up, I'm going to make you the scientist uh, in the conversation. Um, but let's go back to that DNA, because you just made a point. Again, they didn't uh, have him as a suspect. They had to compare the DNA to after he was identified. Similar instance with the Golden State Killer. They compared the DNA after they had him as a suspect. So right. people in the audience say, well, why couldn't you just put that DNA into the FBI DNA database, uh, CODIS? and make a match? Uh, I can answer that if you don't want to. (laughs) I I don't know the answer. Why don't you tell me? I will tell you then. Okay, first of all, I'm not sure when CODIS went online. I think it was in the uh, early to late 80s, uh, 90s rather, CODIS, the actual database. So it may not have even been available. And when you, even if it was, when you submit a DNA sample, the sample has to match against a known sample. So they they can't run DNA and say, oh, this is Fred Rosen. They have That's to what I have a yeah. sample of you, just like a fingerprint. If we don't have a fingerprint file for you, those fingerprints don't help any. So, so take an unknown uh, burglary. You right, you've got to have something to compare right. it against. So if we have an, a, a burglary that occurred, we'll take fingerprints, put it in the... there, And then, if we get lucky at another time, be able to pull the fingerprints off, we put it in there, they do the analysis, it matches. Imperfect. Just like the DNA, it's an imperfect process, but a fairly, a fairly reliable one. And we've had false identifications before. But just so you know, you have to have a known before you uh, get there. So back then, in, in CODIS's uh, baby stages, how many known samples could we have had? Probably not many. Yes. Right. So we're going along, as we said, uh, well, and we'll get to the mitochondrial DNA. But so we have 23. What are the, what are the cops doing in the meantime? How is this case unfolding? How are they investigating it? Okay, what happens is um, one day Dennis Thornton 
in the it, this would be about two thousand and five, I think. Thornton is in Jefferson Parish. He was the first cop. I mentioned him earlier. He gets a call. They're organizing a joint task force and uh, state, and there'll be an FBI agent involved, and there's also going to be a, a parole officer involved, and then the lo- cops from the local parishes. And he's the first guy that they call. And he says, sure, I'm in. And eventually what happens is they are uh, uh, they, they he goes he goes uh, down to uh, from New Orleans to Homa. He meets up with Don Bergeron, and then, and then you've got the, the this task force. And a couple of months into the task fo- task force's work, um, they ask the um, parole officer who's part of the, the group. Do you know any, did you ever have any um, of your charges who said anything about a guy that tried to lure them to his, uh, to his house or whatever and, and, and attacked them? And by chance, the parole officer had a charge who um, had indeed been uh, trolled by Dominique on the street and Dominique had taken him to the trailer and he tried to, Dominique tried, to, he was going to kill him. And oh, the guy. Hold on a second. Hold on, because you said the bodies were being found all over the, you know, the bayou, all over the right. parish. What made them ask that question about being lured or attempted to be lured into a van? What made them Oh, no, that? not, I'm sorry. Not, I, 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 no, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, no, I, 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 that's a detail that's. Okay. What they did was they simply asked the um, parole officer, could you talk to your guys and see if any of them had ever been assaulted, ah, okay. assaulted by a guy who wanted gay sex. Okay. Then this, the, it, it was just, it was a chance occurrence. And so the parole officer goes back, he talks to his, his, his parolees, Somebody tells them about uh, t- uh, t- they, 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 the individual, the parolee, takes um, the parole officer and then um, the detectives to Dominique's trailer, which is parked in his sister's driveway in Homa. At that point, the... Um, police uh, just open up the mailbox and they get the guy's name and they know who he is. Now they got their, themselves a suspect. Okay. And what do they do with that? Well, <clears throat> um, what they do with it is they, they start, they put a, a what, they put a tail on him and uh, he, he loses the tail. And um, boy, this sounds like a TV show. And uh, he commits another murder and they are furious. Oh, my God, are they furious? I, ha- he, he, I, have, I have to uh, interrupt with the story there because people will ask, how, how, how do you lose a tail? I've, I've done a lot of surveillances during my career. Uh, when I worked narcotics, that was 99 percent of what we did. We lost tails. Uh, but I remember specifically uh, when I was on the TAC team for the police department, and we were trailing a serial rapist, and he was a suspect. And we were trying to get him in a certain situation when we'd arrest him on an outstanding warrant unrelated to the rapes. We wanted to get him at a certain moment. And we were following him around. And I remember the decision-making process, and get him, don't get him, get him, don't get him, because we wanted to wait till he was in that situation where it would be ideal for us. But we also knew the risk. What if we lost him that night and a mm. rape occurred while we were supposedly following him? How do we justify that in our own minds? And, and we went and just made the arrest prior to being in an ideal situation. But we knew the risk of trying to follow somebody. And this would be quite a few years before your case there. Uh, that's a very risky scenario when you're dealing with a murderer. 
And, yep. And I don't know, even, you know, I know hindsight's always twenty twenty, but I have to think about, you know, whether that was really you know, a good decision. Apparently not. And uh, I'm not quite sure why they made that decision to follow him. Because my question to you now is, what were they hoping to do? Try to find him getting someone in the car? Yes. And, and then what? I mean, even that wouldn't be evidence necessarily. And you, how far would you let that go before you're putting someone in danger? Well, I, I think what they wanted to do was since they didn't have any physical evidence at that point, they wanted to to give him enough rope so they could catch him in the act and then get him to confess. The act of doing what? Trying to kidnap a man for the purpose of rape and then, of course, murder. Right, but again, but, and now we're getting to you know, critical, me being a crit critic, Hindsight 2020 of police, and I know everyone just loves when I do that. But he, he didn't go out and kidnap them in the sense that he took them physically from the bar or from the street. He lured them into a car. Yes, sir. Right. So they're not going to see any criminal act at that point. So now he gets someone in a car, and again, right. they're dealing with this. What if they lose him then? They, they well, you know, you, you, you just brought up a great point. There is, there is no... They could be watching him luring somebody into the car. There's not. There's nothing illegal about that. Right. So they could stop him then. It's just they could stop him beforehand and try to get some DNA at him. We'll do it with a court order. If if they had enough evidence, you know, a court order, you just need, uh, you know, you don't need well, to have a reasonable beyond a reasonable doubt evidence beyond they, a reasonable doubt. They did um, bring him in for questioning briefly, but he didn't give him anything, and they let him go. And the, and. It was after they let him go that he commits another murder. Okay. And, and that's, you know, and again, I don't want to, that happens. If you don't have enough, you don't have enough. You can't hold someone without enough. Let me, at that point, other than DNA, did they have fingerprints? No, not, no, not that I, no. No, in fact, what happens is, you want me to tell you how they, how they get him? Yeah, because I'm, I'm starting to wonder, given all these uh, lapses, what I think are in the investigation. Go ahead. Well, what happens is, you know, they're, you know, they're waiting on DNA. Uh, uh, they, they got, you know, his, you know, they got a court order, so they got his DNA. They compare it to the well, hold DNA. On, hold on. I'm sorry, Fred. They got a court order. So what happened? Because I just mentioned the court order to you, you know, a moment ago. So what happened in between losing him on a surveillance to the point they got the court order that gave them the, the, the impetus to go get the court order that didn't exist earlier. I can't, I, I, you know what? I, I, you, you're, you're being more objective than me. I, um, I don't know what happened. Right. Okay, I mean, and, and we honest. don't know, and, and I don't want to sound ultra critical, again, in hindsight, you know, so many years later. But I'm hearing all this, I'm hearing they're just kind of following the guy, not knowing what to do. This court order for DNA, when you have all this DNA sample sitting there, seems like a very logical next step in the investigation. Well, and but here's the thing. When they did the DNA and they, it comes back, and I, we mentioned it earlier, mitochondrial, which, which is a form of DNA, which it isn't 100 percent it's that person. You can simply say it's somebody from that family. So it's not 100% at trial. They decided at that point that even though they didn't have him 100%, they were going to bring him in, which is exactly what they did, and then he confessed. Right, and, and that was a point I want to get at. You get the mitochondrial DNA, and this is talking about a time when no one knew from DNA, certainly, certainly not us or, you know, or people on the outside. And you bring someone and say, I got this DNA match, here it is, this DNA match. They're not going to know, well, that's mitochondrial DNA. That's not 100% proof. They're going to see that. And you said something very important. He was doing what with those bodies? Where was he leaving them? Where was he leaving them? Well, out in the, out in the, well, exactly. He left them out in the open. And why do you think that was? Oh, he wanted, he wanted credit. He wanted credit. He wanted the he, he, he was he wanted the authorities and others to know that, hey, you know, there's there's you know, there's there's a bad guy around here. It, ga it gave him a feeling of power. 
Right. And, and I think, again, in hindsight, you've got that indication just from where the bodies are laid out. And if you do a little history on him prior to arresting him, you do sort of, sort of a personality profile based on what you know about him. And you take that information and say, hey, we bring him in here. We lay down the evidence. He's probably going to want to brag about it. He's probably going to well, want to be the show. It, the odds it, of a confession it, were very high at that point. I would agree with you. And they did a great job working as a team, uh, Don Bergeron and uh, Dennis Thornton, in, in interrogating him. And, and then, you know, they were able to get his, his uh, confidence, trust, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I mean, and they were able, you know, and they cleared all 23 cases. All right. You said uh, the FBI was working on that case. Do you know if they did a profile or any sort of scientific work for the task force? Yeah, I believe the FBI, the FBI did a profile, um, but they were the ones who recommended a no that was a different case no um the, the, yeah no the fbi gave him a profile you know and it was you know this you know it was the standard cookie cutter profile you know and and, and you know and and in this case it, it i guess it sort of fit do they talk about if you know i mean again it may not have been available to you if they talked about how he'd react when confronted by law enforcement where they felt he would confess don't know anything about that that would be no, I never got access to the profile. Right, yeah, I didn't think so. That would be an interesting analysis on that yeah. profile. Right. So he confessed, and then we talked about what happened then. He confessed, and what did he do then? Well, he confessed, and then the, the detectives conferred with the district attorney, who then conferred with the 23 families of the victims and they and he just they decided to make a deal they would take death off the table if dominique would confess to all 23 murders and take them to the dump sites so that you know and so they'd have their um uh uh you know they could they could put together details so they knew that he was telling the truth you know, the killer, only the killer knows details of the dump site and so forth and so on. And so they made the deal. And the next day they had what I call a cockeyed caravan where they left from the um, uh, the jail in Homa. And they went all around with Dominique to all the dump sites. And he showed him where he did what he did. And once he did all that, they signed off on the um, on the deal. And then, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a year later or whatever, he had to elocute in court, which he did, victim impact statements, et cetera, et cetera. So these dump sites didn't offer any more evidence. It was just a matter of him confirming that he could show where all the bodies were dumped. Yes. Uh, well, in terms of evidence, yeah, they would be able to pick up some evidence, absolutely. Okay. You know, but... But, uh, but all but, three bodies, but all three bodies had already been... Did he, did he bring them to any bodies that they had not yet? Oh, no, found? no, 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 no. So any no. dump site he, to, he went to would already have been processed. Right. For evidence. So hopefully there shouldn't be any new evidence there. Right. But and, they wanted I'm him. Sorry, to, no, they just wanted him, you know, to take them so they knew he was telling the truth, you know. Was, but were these dump sites public information where all these bodies were found? Wasn't it covered in the news? Um... I would say to some extent, um, one of the things to bear in mind again is that you're not dealing with it with a um, a lot of media, mm -hmm. okay? But yes, most of the stuff would have been out. Yes, would have been published about you know when they well, you know you know when please yeah I don't have to tell you this you know you find a body there's certain things you're going to say and there's certain things you're not right. going to say. Right. Did you, did you know through your research? Well, did you you who did you interview for this book? Um, I interviewed um, for the book um, Don Bergeron, Dennis Thornton, the the ch the chief investigators, um, other police uh, that were involved in other venues. Um, and um, I think I talked to the prosecutor. Uh, and in, in those Dominique, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Dominique was not interested in talking. Which is something I want to ask you about. So in those conversations with law enforcement prosecutors, 
Did they reveal to you anything that Dominique said about the murders that no one else could have known? Yes. Could you reveal? Well, that no, 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 no. Did they reveal to me? Well, did they it, reveal that it existed? They say, hey, Fred, just by the way, he did tell us things that no one else could have known. Uh, no, no. Nothing like no, that. No, they didn't. No, they never said that to me. But it was, but it was, but when you read, I, they didn't have to say that. When you read the, um, the guy's confession, he gets very, very specific. Only the killer would know the answers. Okay. Also, Fred, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you in the in the book, uh, you made reference to BTK Killer, which caught, yeah. my, it caught my attention because that was here in Kansas City area, uh, and the FBI office, the office where I worked at, the assistant agent in charge, did take part in helping uh, capture him when he reemerged after a long hiatus. What was the correlation to BTK, and for the audience, that it stood for bind, torture, and kill, which is what this serial killer right. did. What was his correlation to Dominique? Oh, the correlation was, was they were operating at the same time. Okay, any indication that uh, Dominique was watching what he was doing? Press conference? No, or no, but what, of, again, no yeah. but what's again so interesting is just that here you got, you, you got BTK and he's getting all this publicity and so forth. And here you got what's going on in Homa and there's not one, there's nothing on the news. And we hear that often about you know, missing kids or murder victims, that there seems to be unfair coverage uh, based on sort of the certain socio-demographics of the victim that get the coverage as, not, as opposed to others. Would you agree with that? Th that? Say it again? That there's a lot of complaints often that victims of murder or missing kids or kids that have been killed or kidnapped will get more attention based on their socio-demographics. Uh, I totally the other agree with that. Right. Somewhat unfair. Well, we're not even talking. And what about what about skin color? Same thing. Right. 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 All these are social things, ethnicity. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, you society. know, it, it, I, I, I truly believe in justice, you know, but sometimes it just doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. More than sometimes, I'm afraid, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I actually become more uh, sensitive to that since my retirement from law enforcement more than 10 years ago, mostly in the work I've been doing, trying to help people who claim to have been wrongfully convicted. And when I, I look back at their cases, I have one case I'm really working hard on now, and if people go to uh, change.org, just look up my name, Michael Tab, and you'll see the case I'm really vehement on. Michael? Yeah? I, I can't believe what you just said. I've been trying to get a guy out of prison for 10 years. He's been there for 45 for a murder he didn't commit. His name is Ray Gray. All right. Well, I'm working with a guy. Uh, his name is Carl Leeper, L-E-E-P-E-R. Look it up on change.org. Oh, oh, and I the reason you. I'm frustrated, and I have others also, but this one is particularly frustrating because as I've looked at the police work, and again, I hate to be critical, especially in retrospect. And I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be a know-it-all, but I'm looking at what I'm looking at. And people say, do you know he didn't commit this robbery? And he's been in jail for a long time on a robbery where no one got hurt. I said, no, I don't know. I don't know that he didn't do it. What I do know is that there is no way there's enough evidence that goes beyond a reasonable doubt to keep, be keeping this guy in prison. That's what I do know. Yeah, and I think it's extremely valuable to have a, 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 a former FBI agent commenting on these things because, as you said, yourself, I think it's very, very valuable. It provides tremendous oversight regarding local law enforcement not to be critical right but to get answers i mean right. you, you know it's a search for the truth and that's what justice is is a search for the truth whether it falls our way or not or the way law enforcement wants it to fall and i do a certain amount of media consultations on police stuff and it, it pains me when i have to say i think the police acted inappropriately but sometimes they do and they're just people and we have to look at that and say, well, law enforcement may not be right. And just because someone's been convicted doesn't mean it's a legitimate conviction. And in Kansas, in this state, there's very few, if har hardly any options for taking on those cases. Right. And, and even though in, in three cases I have found evidence that, in my professional opinion, and that of attorneys, should be brought before the court or jury in a new trial, 
the courts have struck it down, but they were right the way the law is now about trying to elect what is considered new evidence. And so to me, this, the entire system is broken judicially and investigatively to try to look for cases where people right. have been wrong. The big topic for another day. <laughs> right. Yes, so, exactly. Anyway, yeah. let's go back to Dominique. Um, he would not speak to you. He spoke to the police, but he, he refused to speak to you, correct? Mm -hmm. I find that kind of interesting based on what we know about his braggadocia. Do you know, and, and, and you may not know this, uh, since he's been in jail, has he been interviewed by the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit? Have they done a profile on him or any other not, analysis? Not that I know of. No, that it, it, not that I know of. It's possible. But, you know, the way it looks, it's like they just dumped him in, in, in um, Angola and that's it. Interesting. Well, maybe after the show, uh, someone, one of my FBI colleagues will hear this and say, hmm, I think we want to go interview him. And I would be surprised <laughs> if he said no. Uh, they like to oh, talk about Oh, I think he'd probably say yes. He's got yeah. nothing else to do. Well, that may, they, it gives him a chance to get some attention and sort of relive this. And we, in our conversation, think he took some joy in, in hurting his victims uh, be, before killing them. And it may give him a chance to relive it. Oh, my other question to you, since I mentioned that. Any indication that after he committed the offense, murdering his victims, did he keep any sort of trinkets or what we call memorabilia, uh, personal belongings of the victim, so he could relive this and look at them later? Any indication of that? Um, not that I recall. He was a little bit, not that I recall. Um, I was able to get access to, um, to the crime scene, I guess you'd call it. I mean, his, he killed most of these individuals in his van. Oh, not van, his... Um, mobile home. So I was able to get uh, access to it. Please let me go in there and so forth. Um, but no, I don't recall. I'd have to look that one up. But, you know, of course, as you as you point out, uh, most of these serial killers like to keep some sort of keepsakes or whatever. Right. And I remember just in the case I alluded to earlier, the serial rapist, when we arrested him in his car, he did have trinkets, you know, jewelry that he took from the victims. He would rape them at their house. He right. The ground floor. And he, he took jewelry and little things, and that was certainly good evidence to have when we arrested him. Right. Uh, so that was very good. Fred, tell us about your other books or, and where we could find them. And other than sure. uh, The Bayou Strangler, what other book would you like to promote? The Bayou here? Strangler is, uh, is uh, available at Amazon.com. Uh, some of my other books, um, I, I wrote a book called Murdering the President, Alexander Graham Bell and the Race to Save James Garfield, in which I was able to prove that while history says Charles Gateau murdered President Garfield, that's not the case. It was, a, it, it, is, it was actually President Garfield's doctor that committed second degree murder. And I was able to prove it. Perhaps the FBI should have recruited you years ago, huh? <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. I, 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 don't, I don't think I would appreciate the competition. So uh, just as well. <laughs> <laughs> but that, and, 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 uh, and, and as I said, Lobster Boy is on sale today for $1.99 again at, um, at uh, Amazon.com. And it, the author is Fred Rosen, R-O-S-E-N, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And that's where everybody could find you. Fred, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that conversation. Uh, I think we're going to have a few more to come. Michael, take care of yourself. Thank you. And, when you and, and do me a favor, when, when you see that other great Kansas lawman, Wyatt Earp, give him my regards. Now, he's afraid of me, but okay, I'll do that. All right, <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight on Crimes and Times. This will be our last new show of uh, the summer season between the traveling of I and, and the uh, engineering staff. We won't have enough time to put shows together. When we get back the next season after the summer, we plan on expanding the scope of crimes and times. We want to look at more unsolved crime and we plan to travel to some of the areas to do that. Start out locally with the Kansas City metro area, but then expand upon that based on the success of that. So if you have stories of unsolved crimes, murders, missing people, write to us. Crimesandtimes at gmail.com. That's crimes and the word and spelled out, crimes and times at Gmail. Let us know the case you're interested in us covering. Please give us a way to contact you, and maybe we'll cover your story. Again, we're looking to do more true and unsolved crime, and missing people, 
and see if we can help out in some respect and go on the road a little bit with our Crimes and Times crew. Please go on YouTube and like us and follow us. Hit that little bell icon. Uh, the more followers that we get, the more platforms we'll be able to broadcast on. Thank you so much for all your support since we started a little less than a year ago. And we'll pick up with new shows after the summer season. We'll be showing reruns of some of our more popular shows uh, for the next several weeks. Thank you and good night.